Well, hello, friends. I'm Dave Combs, composer, songwriter, photographer, entrepreneur, and as of this year, an author as well. Well, I want to thank you for watching this program today. And let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. I'm going to play some music. I'm going to tell some stories. And uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is what I'm asked about most often, and that is the song Rachel's song that is probably been my most popular song. So let me take you back to 1981. I was sitting in my basement playing my piano and just to relax, that's the way I normally do what I do when I want to relax. And I had just freshly tuned my old 100-year-old piano because it, was, it wouldn't hold a tune, so I had finally tuned it up so it would sound okay. And when I always did, when I did that, I would play something pretty. And so that time I sat down at the piano and I just started playing a song. And it wasn't any song that I necessarily had heard on the radio, but it, was, it, just, it just flowed through me to the piano. And so I played it, and I played the verse, and then I played it a chorus, and then back the verse again. It sounded good, so I, I enjoyed playing it. And I didn't think a whole lot about it. And then one day my wife Linda came home from work, and she says, Dave, what is the name of this song that I've got stuck in my head? I've been humming it all day long. And she hummed a little bit of it, and I said, well, it doesn't have a name. And she said, what do you mean? You, you play it on the piano all the time. I said, well, it's just something that I made up. And so she got all excited and said, well, have, have you written it down? Uh, do you, or I said, well, no, it's up here in my head. And, and she said, well, you better write it down because something might happen to you and we'd lose that song. So I said, okay. And so I finally did write it down. And here's what it looked like <laughs> when I wrote it down. It's just a simple you know, the melody with the, the chords written above it. That, it's, so it's a very simple song. So I wrote it down, and sure enough, I put it back in my piano bench. And, you know, I'd play it every once in a while for, for, uh, for us or for friends or whatever. And, and then a couple of years later, some friends of ours had a little baby girl, and they asked Linda and me to be her godparents. Of course, we accepted, and, and so, and the little baby girl's name was Rachel. And so at her christening service, it was just us and the family. And so we were sitting there in the church and listening to the minister say all these wonderful blessings upon little Rachel. And at the end of the formal part of the service, I whispered to Linda, I said, do you think that now might be a good time for me to play this little tune? Because we had never come up with a name for this song. We'd, we'd tried and tried and nothing ever fit. So she said, yeah, okay. So. I went up to the family and said, would it be all right if I played this song? There was a beautiful grand piano sitting on the front of the church there. And they said, sure. So I sat down at the piano and I put my fingers on the keyboard and I started playing this tune. And as I got into it, I keep hearing this <laughs> sniffles out in the crowd and, and I realized that there were tears coming down my cheeks. It was a very emotional uh, occasion and the song seemed to just pull that out of us so when I finished playing the music I looked up at little Rachel being held in the arms of her mother and I said from now on this song will be called Rachel's song in her honor and that's how the song got its name now fast forward another three years I was working with AT&T and having to do a lot of consulting around the country with factories and one of the factories that I visited was in Nashville, Tennessee. And so I was spending like weeks at a time there. They were about to cut over some software and whatever. And so Linda said, well, why don't you go and get a demo recording made of Rachel's song? I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. So one evening while I'm in Nashville, I'm driving around. And if you've ever been to Nashville, there's an area over there called Music Square. And it's got everything music around it, studios and Hall of Fame and everything. And so I'm driving around. I wanted to find a, a studio that I could maybe possibly get a recording made. So I couldn't, everything was, looked like it was closed. I was, you know, it was about seven o'clock at night and uh, in Nashville, like most other places around, they, we, as we say, they rolled up the sidewalks at 5.30. So I finally found a, a building that had a, a car in the parking lot and the building looked like a log cabin or a, a big old barn and it had a, a, a water wheel 
out front of it, and the sign said, the music mill. I said, oh, well, this sounds promising. So I pulled in the parking lot, and I looked through a glass door, and sure enough, there sat a man behind the desk. And so I went over and knocked on the door, and he came and opened it up. And he said, uh, hi, I'm George Clinton. Can I help you? I said, sure, I'm, I'm looking for a studio. I've got a little song that I've written that I'd like to have a demo made, and I'm looking for a studio. So he said, well, well, son, you're in one. And so he invited me in, and, and I looked around in the room there, and here was big pictures of Glenn Campbell and the, the Forrester sisters and Alabama and all these famous people with gold records and platinum records on the wall. And I realized, hmm, this must be some place. And so I told George I'd never been in a studio. So he gave me a, a real good tour of the place, and I was most impressed with all the equipment and the capabilities there. And, and I said, George, do you, do you know a, a good piano player that I could get to, to play this song that I've written? And he thought for a second or two, he said, yeah, I, th I think I know just the right person for you. So he walked over his desk and pulled out his Rolodex and flipped through it, and he said, here, I'll write this number down for you. His name's Gary Prim. And I just give Gary a call, and I'm sure he'll help you right out. So he gave me the phone number. I thanked him profusely and got back in my car, went back to the hotel and called Gary. Well, I got his answering machine, and he's this Gary. Leave me a message, and I'll call you back. So in about 30 minutes, the phone rings, and it's Gary. And he says, uh, this is Gary Prim. Can I help you? And I told him what I needed, that George Clinton had recommended him and so forth. And he says, well, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to do that for you. He said, uh, I said, well, what do I need to do? And he said, well, just send me a cassette tape of it and uh, a, a lead sheet of the music. And I said, okay, uh, but what's a lead sheet? And I, I, cause I didn't know the terminology in, in the music business in Nashville. And he said, oh, it's just, it's just the chords and the melody written out. And I said, oh, well, I've got that. And you remember this, this piece of paper here, that really is called a lead sheet. So I said, well, I've got that. So when I came back home and I sent him the tape of me playing it on the piano so he'd know kind of what it sounded like, and then the lead sheet. And so in a couple of weeks, we met in the studio there in Nashville, a little small studio across the street from the, the big expensive one. And so um, I'm at 6 o'clock on a Friday night. And so Gary comes walking in, and he's got this Yamaha DX7 synthesizer under his arm, and and so I, I meet Gary's really friendly fellow. We just hit it off immediately. And so he comes in, sets up and so forth. And I'm in the back in the control room with the engineer and we're getting everything all set up. And then Gary starts playing my song. Well, I'm in the control room with the engineer and I can hear it through the monitor speakers. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I mean, here, can you imagine? I'm hearing a professional piano player play a song that I had written. But it sure didn't sound as, <laughs> my, the way I played it was very simple, but Gary played it beautifully. I couldn't believe it. So he starts playing and uh, records it, and he gets about halfway through it, and he, he says, no, I, I think I'm going to start over. So he hits the, the keys on the piano like that, and that's a signal for the engineer to, all right, back it up and start over. And so he did. And the next time through, he got through the whole song, and uh, I still, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. And so I thought, wow, this is just amazing. And then Gary says, well, I'm not done. He said, I think we want to add some electronic piano to the, to the song. And he played the, he had moved over to his synthesizer and put his headset on so he could hear the, the piano part along with him playing it on the synthesizer. And he added some piano. And then he said, well, I think we need to add some, maybe some horns in there would be good. And so in a, few, a place or two, and he, he added some horn sounds from his synthesizer. And he said, this would really sound good if we added some strings, just some, to give it a full fullness and everything. So he switched it to strings and recorded, recorded that. And, and I thought, wow, this is just amazing. So when he finished all of that and uh, had added, actually added some horns in there too, finished it all. And uh, he said, well, that's, that's, that's all I can do for it. And he, I said, well, Gary, this is fantastic. So I paid him the uh, the payment that we'd agreed upon and he packed up and left and uh, the engineer and I were still there and, and he said well I need to mix this down to stereo two track stereo for you so you can have it to make a cassette tape or a recording however you want to use it 
So he spent about another, I guess, 30 minutes or so mixing it down to where it sounded just perfect. And then he made me a, uh, a, a master tape. And in fact, I, I have the actual master tape right here, which he made for me. It's a, a reel-to-reel. -reel. You probably remember all these reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Well, this is the original 15 inch per second reel-to-reel -reel quarter inch tape. That's the master recording of Rachel's song. And so he handed me that, and he might as well have handed me a gold bar because I just this was amazing. I said, this is a treasure here. So, so that was the, the master tape, and he made me some cassette tapes of it so I could listen to it in my cassette player in the car. And I want to show you the, 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 the actual tape of the master tape that they used to record Rachel's song. This is it. Now, this is the original. They call it a two-inch master tape. This thing ran at about 30 inches a second. You can see there's a lot of tape in there. But this would only hold like 13 minutes of, of music, and, but it was high quality. But this is the tape that I, that I also brought home with me that was the master multi-track tape. So that, and that thing's heavy. Uh, so, and by the way, if today, if you had one today, you know what you'd come home with? This, a thumb drive. You could put an entire album of recording on this little thumb drive. Well, back then we didn't have thumb drives. All we had was the, the cassette, or the, uh, the two inch reel to reel. Well, I jumped in my rental car and I, I head back to the hotel. And I put the cassette tape in the player, and, and I'm listening to this recording, and I am just blown away. And I'm, I keep saying to myself, this is it. I didn't know what it was, but this is it. It's fantastic. And so I'm riding around Nashville trying to head back to my hotel near the airport. And I look up, and I realize I have passed this bull billboard at least twice. And what I've done, if you've ever driven around Nashville, you know it's complicated intersections about three interstates. If you get in the wrong lane, you're going the wrong place. Well, I apparently got in the wrong lane a couple of times because I circled Nashville at least two times before I finally did get, make it back to the hotel. Well, when I got back to the hotel, I was so excited. I said, I got to tell Linda about this recording because it was more than I had ever expected and I knew that she would be blown away with it too, but I didn't have any way to play it for her. This was back before cell phones. All I had was a landline in the, in the hotel, and I didn't even have a cassette player in the hotel. So I, got, I, t I called Linda up, and I told her, I said, you're just not going to believe this. And I know she thought I had lost my mind or something because I was probably so excited I was on talking double fast and, it, and not making much sense probably. But anyway, uh, I, I, I told her about it. I said, well, I'll play it for you when we get home. It's just amazing. Well, when I hung up with Linda, I said, I've, I've got to play this song for somebody. So I said, okay. I got back in my rental car, and so I drove to what was back then called a Circuit City. It's a big box store like Best Buy and, and those places that sell electronics. And I knew they would have good stereo equipment and recording, a way to play it really good. I walked in there, and I, I found a salesman, and I said, uh, uh, where's your best uh, sound equipment in here? And he took me over to it. And I said, would, would, would you mind playing this cassette tape on your best system you got here? And he said, oh, no, sure. I mean, he grabbed it and took it to put it in the player. And I said, turn it up loud. And so he did. And I noticed when it started playing, of course, it sounded just unbelievable. Everybody in the store just kind of stopped. What is that music that's playing? And that's when I realized, more than I had already realized just hearing it myself, that this song had more potential than I had ever anticipated, and it had something special about it. And so that was my experience of, of getting it recorded. Now, let's go forward to the, the next week when I finally made it home to Linda. I, I, I got home, and as soon as we got home, I, we went to our stereo, and I said, you've got to hear this. <clears throat> and so we played it, and... She was just as blown away with it as I was. And so I, we, we just said, I don't know what we're going to do with this, but it is, is something special. Well, that week, I happened to have a lunch planned with a good friend of mine, Bob McHone. And Bob was a radio personality. He'd been a radio announcer many years and, and had a regular radio program on a local FM station here. But I was having br uh, lunch or breakfast with Bob, 
And on, a, on another matter, we were just having a friendly breakfast. And uh, I told Bob about my trip to Nashville, and, and he was really intrigued with the song. So once we finished breakfast, he said, well, let's go over to my office. I want to hear this song. So, okay. So we went over to Bob's office. And I put it, gave it to him. He put it in his player, and he's sitting there. And he was just as moved by the music. I could tell he was just, his, he had his eyes closed, and you could just tell the music was just reaching him and tears coming down his cheeks. He, he just was as moved as I was with it. And when it finished, he said, Dave, you have got to let me play this song on the radio, on my radio program. And I'd just about forgotten that he had this Saturday morning uh, big band uh, jazz program that he did every week. And I said, well, sure, absolutely. And he said, well, I'll, uh, I said, all I've got is this cassette tape and this, this master recording tape. And he said, well, if you'll loan me the master tape, I'll take it to the station and they can make a copy of it and get it ready to put on the air. I said, well, you <laughs> take good care of this. this is the only copy there is of this this master tape. Okay. He said, okay. So that was that. He took it, and they, they made the copies. And on a Saturday morning, I never will forget it, Linda and I were home, and the program was going to come on, and so I had pre-planned to, I was going to make a tape recording of the, the actual playing of it on the radio with Bob announcing it. And so what I want to do now for you, I fortunately still have that cassette tape recording of Bob McCone announcing and playing Rachel's song for the very first time on the radio anywhere. So right now I'm going to play for you the recording of Bob's announcement of Rachel's song on the air for the very first time. This would be a portrait of jazz you've joined, and we're grateful. And we do it every week here on Classy, 94.5 WKLM. A friend of mine, Mr. David Combs, recently wrote a piece of music. And he had it recorded by a young man by the name of Gary Prim. And last Thursday morning, my friend Dave brought it to my office and wanted me to listen to it, and I knew it would be good, but I had no idea that I would be so moved, deeply moved by this piece of music. And I wanted to share it with you, because I think it is a classic, and I'd like very much for you to listen very closely to it. This is called Rachel's Song. Well, with that magnificent introduction from Bob McCone, I'm going to play for you now Rachel's song on my Steinway piano here at home. Thank you. 
And that, my friends, is Rachel's song. Well, right after Rachel's song played on the radio, I got a phone call from the station manager of WKLM Radio in Greensboro who said, Dave, I've been in radio for a long time and I have never had this happen to me before. He said as soon as they played, we played Rachel's song on the radio, the phones at the radio station locked up. People were calling in saying, what was the name of that song? Would you play that song again? And tell me more about this guy from Winston-Salem. And so he said, this is just incredible. Never happened before. So then I realized, you know, I got to get this out to more and more places. Well, all I had was that master tape and some cassette tapes. And so the next thing I had to do was to create some way of getting it out. And back then, the young people today will probably laugh at this, but this is what I got produced. It's called a 45 RPM single. So Rachel's song is on the, this 45 record. And so then at least when I had the record, I could give it to a radio station or somebody to, to play rather than just a cassette tape. So at that point then, I started finding out how to get my music played on radio stations. And actually, I would go around and, and look for radio towers. I was doing a lot of traveling, and so when I'd be out in the countryside driving around, I'd see a radio tower, and I'd do what Loretta did, Loretta Lynn did, and go find that radio station, and I would give them one of these 45 RPM records and say, would you, would you play this on your radio station? And sure enough, one day I was riding up uh, uh, Highway 52 going to Virginia, and I tuned in the radio station up in Hillsville, Virginia, and I hear this announcer on there. She says, well, now I'm going to play for you my favorite song. And she played Rachel's song. Well, I about ran off the road because it wasn't just a week or two before that I'd stopped in that little station and given them a 45 record of Rachel's song. So anyway, that was the beginnings of getting it played. Well, I figured out how to get it played across the country, uh, getting it into some people who programmed lots of radio stations. And I eventually got it played on virtually every easy listening radio station in the United States. And thanks to Linda's contact of a friend who actually worked in Australia, he took the Rachel song back with him to Australia and Rachel's song became the number one requested song in Australia for two years running. So that was quite an accomplishment with Rachel's song on the radio. Not long after I got the recording made of Rachel's song, one of the people that I played the recording for was my good friend Peter Perret. Peter was the conductor of the Winston-Salem Symphony Orchestra, and he just is a fabulous musician, and I knew he appreciated all kinds of good music, and I wanted him to hear this recording of Rachel's song. So I went by Peter's house, and he was home, and I was able to play him on his cassette player this Rachel song. Well, Peter Perret was actually about as moved with the music as Bob McHone was. He was very touched with it, and he, he looked at me after it finished, and he says, Dave, you need to get this song orchestrated for symphony, symphony orchestra. I said, well, that'd be great, but I don't know how to do that. And he says, well, i tell you what. There's a fellow by the name of Fred Tanner, Dr. Fred Tanner, who's the head of the music department at Winston-Salem State University. He is a wonderful or, uh, orchestrator and arranger for symphony, great musician, and he, he would probably do it for you. And so I called up uh, Fred Tanner and I told him who I was and that Peter Perret had said I should go see him. Well, that's all he needed to hear. So he says, well, can you come on over right now? I said, sure. So I went to his office and walked in and, and we met. He's a great, wonderful fellow. And I told him what I wanted and I said, this song, Peter Perret says needs to be orchestrated for symphony, arranged. And so he said, well, let's listen to it. So he pops it in his cassette player there in his office, and he's sitting there behind his desk, and I, he just, I can tell he's just soaking up the music, and he's, he's obviously moved, just like Peter Perret was, with the music. And when he finished listening to it, he said, Dave, I don't have time to do this, but I have to do this. 
He said, I will do a symphony arrangement for you, for an orchestra. And so I said, wow, P uh, Fred, this is just amazing. So he said, well, you have to give me some time, uh, some weeks to get this done, but I will do it. And sure enough, along about a week or so after Christmas, I get a phone call and it, hi, this is Fred Tanner. I've got your arrangement ready. And so <laughs> I think I must have flew down to his office and picked it up. And I, he, he, handed me, and he handed me what's called a conductor's score. Now, this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's, it's every instrument in the orchestra is down this, this way. And so all the music for every instrument is across there. So the conductor can see what every instrument's supposed to be doing. And he had, this thing is, I don't know, about seven or eight pages long. It's a pretty long thing. And I said, well, Fred, what does it sound like? And he said, well, all I have ever heard it is in my head. He had never had anybody play this except in his head. This is what the talent and the skill of this man is. He's just amazing. So I said, wow, that is, <laughs> I'm sure it sounds fantastic. Well, I made a beeline for Peter Perret's house, and I said, Peter, here is the, the conductor's score. And I said, now what do I do? And he said, well, you've got to uh, write out all of these parts now, one at a time, for each of the instruments. You've got to do a, each, each first violin, second violin, all of those. I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll copy it for, the, for each instrument. Well, that took quite a bit of doing because I had to copy every note that Fred had written down for every instrument one at a time. But I got all that done and sent it over to the, the symphony office, and Peter says, all right, we're going to perform this at our Valentine's Day concert. Uh, this was in 1987. And so I said, great, that's, that's just going to be fantastic. So this concert was set for a Sunday uh, afternoon, and the rehearsal was Saturday night. So Linda, he invited Linda and me to come to the rehearsal. So I went to the rehearsal, we went to the rehearsal, walked into the hall, and of course all these fabulous musicians getting ready, met uh, Elaine Ritchie, the first chair violin, and, and Peter uh, introduced us to the, the whole orchestra. And, and then they played Rachel's song. And of course, <laughs> compared to the other complicated music that they play, this was a piece of cake. They just sight read through this perfectly. And Linda and I could not believe our ears what we were hearing. It was so beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But the, but the surprising thing to me was when they finished, Peter came over to me and he says, Dave, would you like to conduct tomorrow the performance of Rachel's song? Well, of <laughs> That's been one of my bucket list dream items all my life, I think, to, to conduct a symphony orchestra. So I've said, of course, that would do. thank you so much for your generosity. So on Sunday afternoon, when we get to the performance of that, it comes time to play Rachel's song. He invites me up to the stage and introduces me to the audience of about 900 people. It was a packed house. And our Linda and I, we had a table. Fred Tanner was there. Bob McHone was there. And... And a lot of our other friends were there. So he invites me up to the stage, and I walk up, and Peter comes up to me, and he flips over the baton, handle first, and hands it to me, and says, Dave, the stage is yours. And so I step up on the platform, and I got to, perf to conduct the Winston-Salem Symphony playing Rachel's song. And uh, that's a red letter day in my book. I will never, ever forget that. That was just a magnificent experience. And uh, I cannot thank Peter Perret for his generosity and his foresight and, and Fred Tanner for his skill in, in arranging this. It's just a, a wonderful thing. And um, that was wonderful for a Valentine's Day in 1987 in Winston-Salem. Well, if you're a piano player like me, all my life, when I hear a pretty song on the piano played on the radio, whether it was Roger Williams or Henry Mancini or whatever arrangement it happened to be, if you're a piano player, you want to go buy the sheet music so that you can play that song as well. Well, guess what? With Rachel's song, I started getting people requesting, I would like to play Rachel's song like in Gary's arrangement as well. And, and, and matter of fact, 
So would I, you know, I, I play my arrangement of it, but I would need to transcribe the music as Gary played it on the recording. So I got busy and it, believe me, it took a long time of me listening on my headset to Gary's arrangement and writing down the notes that he played of my music. That's called transcribing. And it was, I learned that it's a, it's a, it's a learned art and a skill that not many people really have the ability to do. Now, it took me probably, I don't know, three or four months of sitting on an airplane on trips and whatever, and I'd have my cassette player and my headset, and I'd be listening one measure at a time, writing down every note. But I eventually got it done and was able to produce the sheet music for Rachel's song. And it is basically the notes, note per note, that Gary played on the recording. So now I could play it uh, exactly in the arrangement that he played, and so could someone else. And so that was the beginning of the creation of my sheet music projects, products. And for every recording that we've done since Rachel's song of my original music, uh, I have gotten those transcribed for sheet music as well. So the piano sheet musics are a real treasure for those that play the piano and can in, enjoy the music on their own when they're playing it for themselves or for church services or, or for, for groups or whatever. So that's the story behind the beginning of my sheet music. One of the people who heard the recording of Rachel's song was someone that my wife met who was pretty well connected in the Hollywood Los Angeles uh, entertainment industry. And this gentleman when he heard Rachel's song, he thought immediately, wow, that sounds like a, a theme for a movie or something like that. And so uh, when he went back to California, he talked to some of his buddies out there and he found out that the United Artists was recording a new James Bond movie. And uh, he was telling them about my music and so forth and how it was suitable for a movie and so the long story short was United Artists sent me at his request a synopsis of the movie and a request that I submit some music for the upcoming James Bond movie. The title of the movie was called The Living Daylights and so I was <laughs> unbelievably excited. Now I've never done anything like this before and so I was Wondering, can I write some music for this James Bond movie? I love James Bond movies. Anyway, Linda and I always, when the new one comes out, we've got to see it. So I, I thought, well, I, I don't have the words to go with a song. And I immediately thought of my high school buddy friend, Stan Moon. Stan is a wonderful guitar, jazz guitarist and musician. So I, told, I called Stan up and I told him what was happening. I said, you reckon we could collaborate and come up with a song that might be appropriate for an upcoming James Bond movie? And he got all excited about it too. So he got busy and he came up with some lyrics and, and then we got together and he sent the lyrics to me and I sat down at the piano and, and I came up with what I thought was a, a good James Bond sounding movie, uh, movie thing. And so we put the two together, the lyrics and uh, the music, and, and Stan's wife, Carmen, was a wonderful singer as well. So we arranged for Gary Prim in Nashville to meet him at the studio, and we were going to record the demo of this song. And the, the, the title of the song was Danger in Your Love. Well, what an appropriate title for a James Bond movie. And so the music and the lyrics all went with all of that. We met in the studio, and... and uh, Carmen sang it, Stan played the guitar on part of it, and, and Gary played the piano, and it, was, it turned out really great. And then I got the chance to, I flew to Hollywood and met the United Artists person at, I think we met at the Hard Rock, Hard Rock Cafe in, uh, in Hollywood, kind of an iconic place. And so I played the song for him, this, this young kid, and... Uh, he, he liked what he heard, and he said, now, I, I like it, but I have to submit it to the folks that make the decisions. He says, you know, Cubby Broccoli is the, the, 
director of the movie. He's the one that makes the final decision about what songs are going to be in the movie. Well, another long story short, I found out later that he called me and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but your song did not get selected for the movie. Some other uh, group from over in Europe called AHA got the, the, the nod to do the music. So I was so disappointed that, that we didn't make it, but I knew it was a long shot anyway. And so I decided, well, I, the song is so beautiful, I'd like to put it on my album when I create a, an entire album with Rachel's song and other songs, but it, it needs to not have any lyrics. I want instrumental music on my albums. And so I went back to a studio in, in Rockville, Maryland, and took my master tape in there and basically recorded the melody on an instrument instead of a voice and made the song. And we changed the title from Danger in Your Love to just Your Love. And so now what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to play this, this song, Your Love, for you. And I'm going to play it along with the recording of the Your Love that's on the album of Rachel's song. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you're a piano player, you can do the same thing. You can put the record on and play along with it yourself. So here is Your Love and me playing along with it. That was that's always fun to play along with and so that is 
danger and your love transformed into just simply your love. And that's the way it appears on the Rachel's Song album. Well, now, after getting Rachel's song recorded and then the Your Love or Danger in Your Love recorded in Nashville with Gary, I pretty well had decided I need to do enough music to create an entire album. And this was about the time that CDs were coming along. And so I needed more music to uh, write, to record, to fill out an album. And I got busy and I wrote some more songs. And I would send them to Gary Prim and he would work up his arrangements of it. And then we would meet back in the studio in Nashville and record these songs. And I eventually ended up with enough songs to create a whole album that we called Rachel's Song. And one of those songs that I recorded on that album is called Symphony of Peace. And that song is in the minor key and it's uh it's very peaceful sounding i think but it's uh it's fun to play and what i'd like to do on this one also is i'd like to play symphony of peace for you on the piano and again i'm going to play along with gary prim's arrangement on the recording so here is symphony of peace <laughs> Another pretty song. I just love playing along with those. Once I had gotten my music recorded as a CD and it got played on the radio with uh, lots of more songs and all over the country, I started getting something I'd never gotten before and that is fan mail. Letters would come in and people would tell me how my music had touched them and they would tell their story of where they first <clears throat> heard Rachel's song and so forth and and uh, it got played on the radio more and more. And one of the phone calls that I got was from a man who was the station manager of KEZK Radio in St. Louis, Missouri. And he called and he said, Dave, our radio station loves to play your music. Rachel's song is uh, really, really popular. And he said, every year we run a contest with our listeners and ask them to tell us who their most favorite artists are that they like to listen to <clears throat> and then we will have a uh, a concert where we will invite the top artists to come to st louis and do a performance and a concert 
for free for our listeners. And he said, well, we ran the contest this year, and you're one of the winners in our contest. I said, wow, that's pretty amazing. I said, who, who were the other uh, the artists that they wanted to hear? And he said, well, there's the Letterman, there's uh, the Association, there's Don McLean, and George Benson, and you. And I said, wow, I'm really in, the, in, in with some really fantastic musicians. So lo and behold, they invited me to uh, come to, to St. Louis to perform on at this concert. Now, I said, how many people are going to be there? And he said, well, we're going to have it out in Booter Park, which is outdoors. And he said, it's a, a big park, and we're expecting probably around 25,000 people to show up. I said, 25,000? And he said, yes, that's right. I said, wow, I've, <laughs> I've certainly never played for that many people before, but this will be great. And they flew us out there and, you know, put us up in a hotel, a limousine, and all the, you know, the treated like uh, royalty. And I was, <laughs> for a country boy from Tennessee, that was pretty amazing. And so uh, I uh, got ready for the concert. And while we were there, we met the Letterman. They were in the same hotel with us. We had breakfast with them one morning and really nice people. And so uh, Tony Vitala and, and uh, the, the, the other Donovan T and uh, I forget the, Linda. What's the name of the Bobby Bobby Poynton? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> let me start that that over. And we had breakfast that morning with the Letterman, and it was Tony Butala and Donovan T and Bobby Poynton, and uh, they were just friendly, and we we got to know them, and and I believe it or not. I was on the program right before the Letterman. And so I did my performance of Rachel's song to 25,000. Now, 25,000 people is a lot of people. You look out and that's just a sea of people. But they were so appreciative and uh, really uh, enjoyed my playing of Rachel's song and my music. And, and after my part of the program, of course, the Letterman come up and do their thing. But KEZK Radio had put up an autograph tent over beside the stage. And so my wife, Linda was with me, and so we went over to the autograph tent, and I had shipped a bunch of tapes and CDs out ahead of time. And I stood there and met people that came to hear me play, they said, from as far away as Chicago and Minneapolis and all over the, the Midwest just to hear my part of the program. I was just so humbled by the, the fact that they would come to, just to hear me play Rachel's song and my music. What an experience. And so I stood there all afternoon. It was a clear sky day, and I forgot to wear any sunscreen or a hat, and I got the worst sunburn you can imagine. But I met uh, hundreds of people came. They were lined up to, to, to meet me and get my autograph and talk to me and, and tell me what my music meant to them. What an afternoon. And we, we kept up. We have kept up with the Letterman. They are uh, they're a, a group that keeps up with their friends and their fans and probably as well as any performing group ever. And so we've got to hear them play. They came to Winston-Salem. We took them to lunch for uh, before their performance, and, and we went to see them perform in Myrtle Beach. And they're just a great group of people. So uh, getting to know the Letterman was another highlight of my musical journey. One of the questions that I frequently get asked is, well, how did you end up selling your music, you know, making a market out of it? And that's a really good question because when I, we first started out with my music, I was very naive and I thought, well, the record stores would just be knocking on my door wanting to sell my music because it was so popular on the radio and people loved it. Well, I had a real education in, <laughs> in store for me there. Uh, the record stores, they didn't want to have anything to do with me because they never heard of Dave Combs and I wasn't a big name or a famous person and I wasn't out on the road doing concerts and that kind of thing. So I pretty well struck out with going the standard route of selling my music and really was pretty discouraged there for a while. <clears throat> and then one of the people that I worked with at AT&T gave one of my Rachel Song CDs to a friend of hers who owned a gift shop in Old Town Alexandria. The name of the shop was called America. She 
sold and uh, patriotic kind of uh, items, you know, flags and anything patriotic. And in her shop, she played music. She played patriotic music, John Philip Sousa, all the, those kind of things. But my friend gave her Rachel's song. Well, she put Rachel's song in her CD player. Uh, it was a five CD changer thing. And so when Rachel's song would come on on the sound system in her store, <clears throat> you can imagine the contrast from a John Philip Sousa really loud band sound to all of a sudden here's Rachel's song, very soft, soothing music. Well, every uh, customer in the shop would stop and go over to the counter and ask her, what is that music you're playing? <clears throat> well, next thing I know, I get a phone call from Jane that owned the store, and she says, Dave, I've been playing your music, and would you sell me some of it because my customers want to buy it and take it home with them? And I said, well, sure. So we reached on an agreement on the price and whatever. And she said, well, you know, bring me some. And at the time, we were living in Maryland and working in that area. So on the evening, I boxed up a box of CDs and tapes and took them down to Old Town to take to Jane's shop. And I delivered them to her. And then about three or four days later, I get another phone call from Jane. She says, Dave, those are all gone. i got to have some more. <clears throat> and so... I boxed up some more, and, you know, I'm, Linda and I made that trip every week, probably for the next year and a half at least, uh, delivering CDs and tapes to the America shop down in Old Town, Alexandria. And that particular happenstance, which uh, I couldn't have planned it any better, I don't think, made the light bulbs go off in my mind that maybe if the shops, if there were other shops like hers, that we might have a business model here. And I got to calculating how much money was being made from this one little shop and how many CDs and tapes she was selling and put a spreadsheet together. I'm a mathematician and a business MBA person, so I, of course, do spreadsheets and stuff. So I created a spreadsheet and said, okay, here's what kind of money we're making from just one gift shop. <clears throat> I said, well... I wonder if there's not but one gift shop like hers, maybe in every state in the union, okay? So you take and add another column in the spreadsheet and say it's, okay, column one times 50. And you look at the numbers and say, hmm, well, that's a pretty good-sized number there. Hmm, I, that looks pretty good. Well, what if there were maybe five gift shops in every state? Well, that'd be five. That'd be 250 gift shops. And so another column with 250. And I go, hmm, that's more than I'm making at AT&T. Hmm, this might work. So Linda and I got busy on weekends and evenings and whatever and tried to figure out what, how do we find these gift shops all over the country then that are like this gift shop in Old Town. And on weekends, we'd go out in the countryside and find these tourist places. And, of course, we knew about Gatlinburg, Tennessee and Blowing Rock, North Carolina and places like that. And we found a place called Ellicott City, Maryland, and, of course, uh, other little towns around. And sure enough, we'd go in a gift shop, and <laughs> it was kind of funny. We'd walk in, and I would really just listen. And if I didn't hear any music, then I'd probably just turn around and go to another shop. But if I walked in there and they were playing my kind of music, you know, uh, instrumental, soft kind of music, I'd find the, the shop owner, and I'd say, hey, uh, would you be interested in, you know, playing it? another piece of music I, I have a cd or an album here and i would say i'd leave it with them and and has asked them to if they like it to call me and we could do some business well get back home and after we dropped off all these tapes and cd samples all around my answer machine your phone would have these calls yeah we love your music uh, how about sending us a dozen tapes and a couple dozen cds and we'll we'll get started well, we, we did that for a, a while, and we kind of ran out of territory that we could drive to on a weekend. You know, you can only drive so far, and you're running out of territory. And so I figured I needed to expand this process out into a wider part of the country. But in the wider part of the country, I did not know where these tourist towns were. In fact, I, I determined that it had to be tourist towns because shops in big cities they weren't really interested in my kind of music. It was only these little quaint little tourist town shops. 
but I didn't know where the tourist towns were in Missouri or Oregon or Idaho or Louisiana or whatever. But I finally figured out a way to calculate where these tourist towns were. And the way I did it was I bought the mailing list for all of the gift shops in the United States, a big printout. It came as a paper printout about four inches thick. And then I found a book in the library called The Marketing Atlas, and it had every crossroad in the United States and the population. And, you know, the, the characteristic of a tourist town is that it has tons of shops, but the, the resident population of the town is fairly small, like Blowing Rock, North Carolina may have, I don't know, let's say, just for talking purposes, a thousand people. It's got more than that, I'm sure, but, but, and then they've got like maybe 75 gift shops. Well, there's no way in the world that a thousand people or 1,500 or whatever could support 75 gift shops. So I created a spreadsheet or a database again, and with the, the town, how many gift shops were in that town and what the population was. And then another column, I had the computer calculate what's the ratio of people per gift shop in that town. And then I sorted the database in that, by that ratio. And lo and behold, the towns like Blowing Rock and Gatlinburg floated to the top of this printout like cream on top of milk. And it was unbelievable. And then I could go and any, it didn't matter which state, I knew where the tourist towns were because of this calculation. And I started calling only those places, and sure enough, my hit rate went from 1 in 30 success to 1 in 5. Now, that's, that's a, a quantum leap in success of that. And to make a long story short, I ended up with over 1,000 gift shops all across the entire country playing and selling my music. And it became known as the play and sell market. That's the term that it eventually became known as, and now everybody does it. But back then, it was me and about two other musicians around the country that were playing and having people play and sell our music in this market. And so that's how I got my music started in, uh, as a business and an entrepreneur model. So this is a, a story that if you're an entrepreneur, you need to replicate that. You find something that works small, and you just replicate it all over the place. And that's my entrepreneur story. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, when did you learn to play the piano? And my answer is that I grew up in a family that loved music. My mother played the piano. She took lessons when she was a little girl. My father played the piano. He played mostly by ear. And then, but my Major influence, or one of my major influences, was my grandmother Combs, Granny Combs as we called her. And Granny was only four foot eight, but she could make some music. She played by ear and she, she read shape notes on her old church hymnal, but she loved to play the old pump organ at church and sing hymns. But her favorite instrument, I think, at home was her auto harp. I'm sure many of you have seen an auto harp. It looks like this. It's it's basically just a stringed instrument that sounds really, really wonderful. It's kind of a country instrument, probably made famous by Maybelle Carter in, in that era. But my grandma Combs, when I would go see her, first thing that she'd ask me to do is, Dave, would you tune up my auto harp for me? Because I had a pretty good ear to tune it, so I'd take her auto harp, tune it up where it sounded good, and then I would hand it to my grandma Combs. And then what happened next was something I would give anything if I had recordings of it now, but of course I don't. But she would play her auto harp and sing some favorite hymns. And here's what it sounds like. <clears throat> mm. I can just hear her singing. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. 
was blind, but now I see. Brings back a lot of memories, but that's how I started out my life, hearing that kind of music as a kid, and, and of course growing up in church and singing in the choir and being around people who loved Christian music and good, good old hymns and choir specials. So I was around wonderful music all my entire, entire life, and I can never remember a time when I couldn't play at least something on the piano. So my music goes way, way back. So I wanted you to know that story. It's very precious to me. After recording the Rachel Song album, the next album that we decided to do and this was in 1987, was a Christmas album that year. And then, uh, because I had not written enough original music to do another original album yet. But then after the Christmas album, uh, Linda, my wife, came up with a suggestion that uh, why didn't I set a goal of writing, or at least the, the outline of a song, every day. And so what I did was, b before I would get up and go to work in the morning. She went out to work early. And so while I was getting up early, I would go to the piano in the living room and I would sit down and basically attempt to write a new song. Sometimes it worked really well and sometimes it was a little bit of an effort. But essentially, after not too long, I had written enough songs for a second original composition album and so we took those uh, songs to Nashville and recorded them and so now I would like to play for you the title song for that album which we called Beautiful Thoughts.
And that was the title song to the album, Beautiful Thoughts. Now let me take you back to 1994. Linda and I had moved back from Maryland back to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And we were operating our music business full time, both of us. And I was answering the phone one day in uh, our basement office for Combs Music. The phone rang, and on the other end of the line was a woman who introduced herself as Roberta Messner. And she was telling me how much my music had meant to her and her own personal story. She had had some very serious health issues herself, and she was basically pouring out her heart and soul about how much my music had helped her through her painful surgeries and situation with her health. And then she was very inquisitive. She was asking me about, well, how did, tell me the story behind Rachel's song and how you wrote it and so forth. <clears throat> and I did that. And so she was very interested. And before the conversation was over, she said, well, Dave, I need to tell you that I am also a writer for Guideposts magazine. Of course, I knew about my Guidepost magazine as most people do. It's a little, that little magazine that has all kinds of good, feel good, uh, inspirational stories in them. And so she said, uh, your story is an inspirational story that sounds to me like it would be a perfect fit for Guidepost Magazine. So I said, well, well, okay. And she said, would you be agreeable for me to at least pitch the idea of your story to the editors of Guidepost to see if they would like to publish an article? I said, well, sure, let's, let's go ahead and do that. And to be quite honest, I didn't know for sure what, what would happen from that. You know, people tell you things and promise things, and sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. But in this case, she agreed to go ahead and, and pitch the idea to Guidepost. Well, she called me back in just a few days and said, Dave, I've talked to the editors, and they want me to write, help you write a story and publish your story in Guidepost's magazine. I thought, wow, this is great. Now, she says, the way I do this is I will help you write the story and I will send it to you for your approval and then we'll submit it to Guideposts and then their editors will do their thing and, and it may, this may take several months to do this. And so she said, I'll, I'll need to call and interview you extensively so I can make sure the story has a lot of uh, detail in it that is needed. So, okay, so she called me back several times and we would talk for maybe even 30 minutes, even an hour, tell, I'd tell her all my stories and as much background as I thought that she needed to help me write the story. So she submitted the story to Guideposts and a few months later, actually, uh, the phone rang again and it was the editor from Guidepost magazine. And the editor said, uh, well, Dave, we are getting close to publishing your story and we need some photographs for the magazine. And I hadn't even thought about that. And so I got my, I am a photographer, so I did have the, the camera and equipment. And so I, I got my tripod out. I said, okay, I'll send you some pictures. And so I, Linda, actually Linda took the picture of me sitting at the piano, playing the piano. And then I took my tripod out in the backyard <laughs> and Linda and I and our cat Melody, and we took a picture of us standing there actually under a, a, an outdoor swing. And I sent those two pictures off to Guidepost. Well, I think that was probably late spring of, of 1994. And then I had no idea when the magazine was actually going to hit because they do it. It was a monthly magazine. But come September, actually it was a September issue, so I believe it actually hits the streets sometime late in August. But I, if, if I had my calendar, I could tell you the exact day that it hit the street because something happened that had never happened before to us. As soon as that magazine hit the street, my phone started ringing at Combs Music, and it never stopped because they had put my, my uh, phone number and address in the back of the magazine, said, if you want to know more about Dave Combs and his music, uh, you can write to him here, and the cassette tapes are 10, and the CDs are 14 or whatever, and, and here's his phone number. And so, and so the, the, the Guidepost magazine was September of 1994, and on the inside of it, there was an article titled, Two-Part Harmony. And it's my story of how I wrote Rachel's song and how the, 
the progress and the journey with Rachel's song actually led to my being able to quit my job at uh, AT&T and do my music full time. Well, the phone rang and rang and rang. I ended up having to hire two people to help me answer the phone because uh, you just put your hand on the receiver, pick it up, somebody's there. It was that, that many people calling. And, and the, the funniest thing was, in about two or three days, my front doorbell rang, and I went to the door, and it was my mailman. He's standing there holding this big gray canvas bag that was too heavy for him to pick up. And he, he said, Dave, what have you done? He said, this bag is full of mail to you. And I said, really? <laughs> and so we, we took the mail in, and, you know, Linda and I had to stay up that night from all night long. It was 6 o'clock in the morning before we finished opening the last of the letters that were in that one bag. And, you know, we received in, in less than two weeks letters and calls and notes from over 10,000 people about my music. And uh, I'm going to put up on the screen for you now what Linda and I later on, we pulled all these letters and notes out and put them, stacked them up on my pool table so we could just see how many these kind of letters look like because eventually I heard from over 50,000 people about my music and how it had touched their life. And so I'm going to show you now the picture of me standing behind my pool table with this stack of 50,000 boxes of 50,000 notes and letters from people. And it is just an incredible, overwhelming situation because when you read those, they're not just very cryptic notes. They're pouring their hearts out about well, how the music has touched them or what was their circumstance when they first heard Rachel's song. Almost everybody tells me I know exactly where I was the first time I ever heard Rachel's song. So I am so blessed that this little article in Guidepost magazine, and thanks to my dear friend now, Roberta Messner, she got me on the path that basically told the world about my music and Rachel's song, and it really did reach out and touch and bless literally millions of people, and I'm forever grateful for that. Back in 2020, when the pandemic had just begun, all of us can remember the news stories that we began to see when the emergency declarations were made and the doors were locked basically and people couldn't go visit their relatives. The uh, people that were in nursing homes or in assisted living facilities, any uh, elder care facilities were basically confined to their rooms. Well, those news stories really hit home for me because my mother had spent two and a half years in assisted living at Arbor Acres here in Winston-Salem and I went to see her every day while she was living here. And I know firsthand how much the socialization aspect of living in an assisted living or a nursing home can be. Without that, they are really under a tremendous amount of stress. It's an almost an unimaginable amount of stress when you're not able to see and touch and feel or hug your own children or your grandchildren or your relatives or even your friends. And so that was something that really worried me a lot about this pandemic, and it, it only really got worse from that point. And so I decided I got to do something because I know firsthand as well how much music, in particular my music, had meant to mom and her neighbors there at Arbor Acres. Uh, I would go out there and play the piano and do a little program, play Rachel's song and other, other music for them, and, and they just thoroughly enjoyed that, and that was a great outlet for them and, and me as well, a great connection. And so I thought, they, these people have to have some relief from this constant stress and strain that they're under. So I said, okay, I know my music relaxes and is soothing to people, and I'm also a photographer, and I take a lots of pictures. I love pictures of flowers and landscapes, anything with a you know sunsets, sunrises, anything with really pretty. And so I had tons and tons of photographs. And I said, okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a music video with my photography and my music playing behind it, and have that such that it'll, I'll put it up on YouTube, so anybody in anywhere in the world can actually see it and hear it. And I'm going to 
make those so that these activities directors at these facilities can make this available to their residents for them to to watch and listen to to hopefully take their mind off of the the difficulties of the pandemic situation so i made some videos with just one song so that they could listen to one song but the other thing that i did that was fairly unique was i took and made videos with my music and photography that would play for six to seven hours. So a, an activities director in a facility could just basically put it on someplace where people could see it, push play, and then they didn't have to worry about it for the next six, seven hours. They didn't have to tend to it or worry about whether it stopped and got to restart it. And so I made about four videos that were long playing, six to seven hours with my, my music and photography and so I, I, I called Janice Van uh, Lutz at uh, Arbor Acres and asked her to try it out to see whether she thought it would really be good. And so Janice said, yeah, this is great. So, so she was encouraging. And so I said, well, there's got to be some other places like this that I'd like to get it out to. So I began calling around and talking to the activities directors for other uh, facilities in North Carolina. Turns out there are, are, are like 400 assisted living and I forget how many, there's, there's, there's close to a thousand facilities just in, in North Carolina alone. And I called personally 200 activities directors across the state of North Carolina and told them what I had produced and that it was, I was going to make it available to them for free where they could play it for their residents. They were most appreciative and, and grateful. And then I uh, started getting letters and emails back from them saying how much it had meant to them. And I thought, well, I've got to get this out to, you know, there are like 44,000 facilities in the entire United States. And I thought, well, there's no way in the world I can call that many people. And so Linda and I used to live in Old Town Alexandria, and that's the town that probably has more associations than probably any other town in the country because there's an association for everything. And sure enough, there's an association for assisted living facilities. There's an association for nursing facilities, there's or nursing homes. And, and then there are one of those in each state. And then it turns out there was also a national association. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna call the associations because their membership then are these facilities that I need to get this, this uh, music out to. So I called all 66 associations in the entire country and almost all of them were eager to to take what I had produced and basically put it in their newsletters or their communications out to these facilities so that those then could have access to my soft soothing relaxing music and so I was so pleased that eventually I was able to get my music available to all 44,000 of these facilities across the entire United States and and they're still able to do that today. So that was my approach to giving back to a, a community of people in these retirement villages and facilities that mean so much to me and mean so much to everybody really. And so uh, I'm really pleased with how that turned out. Here's another song from my Rachel song album called Abundant Joy. And I'm going to be playing along with the original recording performed by Gary Prim. Hope you enjoy it.
Well, that was fun. I hope you enjoyed that song. It's another one of my favorites. I sure hope that you've enjoyed this program, and I want to encourage you to go and check out my music on my website. You can see all of my music and Rachel's song in particular. Go to combsmusic.com, and you can read about Rachel's song and my other 15, a total of 15 albums. And also, check out my new book, Touched by the Music. And a lot of the stories that I've told on this program are in my book, and a lot more as well. So check it out, and you can purchase it at wherever books are sold, and particularly on Amazon and paperback or Kindle book or even an audio book. If you want to listen to me read it to you for eight hours, you can do that as well. So thank you for joining us today, and I hope you've enjoyed the program, and maybe we'll do this again another time. Thank you so much.